I am 22 years old, and I came out as a straight, sexual woman when I was 19. Like many of my peers, didn't realize that that could happen. Attending a women's college in the suburban town of Wellesley just might have had something to do with that process. But more importantly, what I learned in my so-called coming out process is that unless there is a direct need to deviate from societal expectations, we, as Americans, fail to recognize the nuances of sex and sex sexuality. Beyond broad definitions of anatomy and mechanics, classroom conversations do not live up to the standards of desire that we speak about in the media on a regular basis. The conversations about protection and consent are a far cry from what we actually should be talking about. This discrepancy is why I believe that we need to redirect our conversations about women and sex in this country. Furthermore, I believe that in an attempt to expand the definition of female sexuality, we have instead managed to dichotomize the issue. From Dove commercials to Amber Rose's slut walks to Caitlyn Jenner, America does not fail to speak about women, what makes a real woman, what a real woman is allowed to do, and with whom, what a real woman needs. And while I'm happy that we're finally talking about real women, I believe that the way we speak about women, female bodies, and sexuality remains constricted to a set of codes. As many of you might know, the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show is one of the most highly lauded fashion events and attended events of the year. The models who perform in the show are considered the sexiest women in the world. They epitomize womanhood. But imagine the same models with chunkier thighs, a little bit of razor burn, a tampon string hanging out, oh God. <laughs> too much woman, too close to what many call a reality. You see, we applaud the youthful look of a woman's chest after a breast augmentation, yet tell 10-year-old youthful girls that they look inappropriate without bras. Their bodies, the softness, the realness disturbs us. A woman with a guttural grunt of pleasure or a ruthless tenacity for one night stands terrifies us. And our responses tell us that women aren't good enough as they are until they act as we expect them to. A girl is placed into womanhood at the onset of puberty. And with that milestone come all of the societal expectations surrounding how that woman will act and develop sexually. I'm not making an argument about what makes a woman real in terms of size or shape or assigned sex. Instead, I'd like you to ask yourself if you recognize yourself or the women around you in the portrayal of women in movies, in the media, in conversations about birth control. I want you to ask yourself why we see what we do. I don't think we need to see any more billboards advertising lubricants or lingerie or mundane household objects like espresso machines to know that America is obsessed with sex. With Cosmo sex tips on the 200 new positions guaranteed to drive your guy wild. How to keep and please your man. How to keep him interested in your body. And conversely, America is obsessed with purity. What preserving your purity truly entails. How to keep your body unscathed and sacred. What happened to the in-between? From a very young age, I have been preoccupied with thoughts about what it means to be pure, what it means to be raised in a country where the roots of most institutions are puritanical. Interestingly enough, the way many young adults in America are introduced to the concept of purity is through some sort of health education course. When I think back to my own sex ed class back in seventh grade, I do have to admit that it was pretty open-minded and advanced for what it was. Apart from conversations about lambskin versus latex, we spoke about all the possible ways that STDs could be transmitted without protection. We spoke about all possible sexual orientations. In fact, our teacher drove home the point about the salience and of course the validity of non-heterosexual relationships to the point where most of us went home and changed our MySpace profiles to say that we were bisexual. 
<laughs> but to be honest, none of us knew what that meant. Yes, in theory, if you identified with a particular sexual orientation, you were attracted to one or multiple gender types and hopefully were romantically involved with people who fit into those categories. But if you had asked any of us why you would have sex with someone, other than to potentially procreate, none of us would have been able to answer the question. One day, a question was asked by a girl who, as an athlete, was very concerned about what went into her body. And so, to our teacher's horror, she asked, how many calories are in a sperm? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the wording of the response, but that day, all of us girls learned a few things. One, boys want blowjobs. Two, you're a slut if you ask about it. And three, later on, outside of the classroom, we learned that we were naive if we didn't offer them. In an effort to uphold the image of the modern woman, we have limited the conversation about women and sex to two ends of a possible spectrum. We talk about sexual assault and when things go wrong. The gray areas revolving around if someone gave consent or was even able to. And then we talk about the modern woman who is free and empowered and has sex with everyone whenever and whenever she wants to. But what about all the things in between? We seem to have missed something. And this is a big step from the days from before the pill, when just the thought of pregnancy loomed over unmarried women's heads. But we're still at the forefront of filling in this possible spectrum on a national level. Institutionally provided health classes have moved on from only teaching how to put condoms on bananas and abstinence to finally discussing consent. Discussing consent comes in response to the rising dialogue about sexual assault on college campuses and in courtrooms. The jurisdiction of who's to blame if the accused was a knowing perpetrator. These are incredibly important and incredibly difficult conversations to have. But here's my problem. We can't talk about saying no if we don't understand what it means to say yes. We've managed to integrate IUDs and the morning after pill in our conversation about contraception, but somehow fail to recognize that most adolescents just really want to know what sex feels like and how to distinguish the good from the bad experiences. Because currently, the millennial anthem has our young women listening to older peers listing the number of orgasms that they had last night with the person that they had just met how they've orgasmed to the point where their feet feel discombobulated from their bodies. And you look down and you see that your feet are really still attached to your ankles. And you can only wonder what that feels like. But you say, yeah, I know what that feels like. Because you're a feminist and you know how to get what you want and you know how to keep your man because you know how to play the game right because you were worth it to yourself to play the game right because that is what we call sexual liberation. With our dichotomized perception of how women engage with sex, we've created these exclusive scenarios. Women either have sex or they don't. We either gave consent or we didn't. It may be that this binary system is accurate and that it is impossible to fully encompass female or any sexuality in any further concrete terms. But the problem remains this. Female sexuality is defined by and driven by society and is therefore, by definition, restricted. Moreover, female sexuality and desire is defined in response to male desire and then the messages that the media continually perpetuates. Don't get me wrong. There is a place in this world for glamour and Elle and Cosmo. But magazines in of themselves are not enough to tell young women about their bodies and their desires. What about movies? Apart from perfect sex scenes where all parties involved orgasm simultaneously, someone confesses their love or proves to be the ultimate dominatrix, there's nothing that really shows us what female pleasure looks like. And when it really comes down to it, female pleasure remains the afterthought 
and there's no individual difference. Audiences were stunned by the image of Ben Affleck's face near Rosamund Pike's pelvis in that one scene in Gone Girl. Sure, women's magazines have taken some steps to affirm female needs by including articles about the best vibrators. Nonetheless, most young women have their sexuality placed onto them before they even know what their erogenous zones are. We were assumed to be straight, sexual beings because of our bodies and our gender. I'd like to ask everyone in the audience here to close their eyes. I see you. <laughs> um, please raise your hand if you identify as a sexual being. Please keep your hands in the air or raise them if you've ever faked an orgasm. Thank you, you can open your eyes now. The researchers Gail Brewer and Colin Hendry found that 82% of sexually active women admit to faking orgasms on a regular basis. To add to the picture, uh, economist Hugo Mylon found that 72% of women who are in stable relationships admit to faking orgasms with their partners. These statistics beg the question why women would engage in sex at all if they predominantly fake pleasure. As one of my friends put it, faking an orgasm is one way of making it seem like you know what you're doing when you truly don't. Some other people might say that women have sex to get what they really want, that it isn't about sex itself, but keeping the partner, to find stability, to get the ring. <laughs> this line of thought fits the notion that women are biologically programmed to have lower libidos than their male counterparts. But, as author Daniel Bergner of What Do Women Want found, it seems as if women may or may not have equal to, if not greater, libidos than men. The difference is in the risk that women face in pursuing and expressing this drive. Women who orgasm and are sexually active are easily labeled as sexually promiscuous, empowered, Women who have sex have to know what they're doing, right? I mean, a woman wouldn't choose to be labeled as sexual if she weren't, right? Well, choice is a finicky concept, particularly when it comes to violations of choice, of rights. Currently, one of the most discussed violations of choice is sexual assault. Sexual assault is one of the worst things that can happen to someone, and I am thankful that we have created the platforms for victims to work through and talk about their experiences. But while sexual assault affects far too many people, this can't possibly be the only outlet that allows women to speak about their nuanced experiences of sex. Understanding pleasure and how it varies from person to person is essential to understanding what it means to give consent or to withhold it. And the reception that a woman receives when she admits that she was sexually assaulted just shows how much a woman's relationship with her body, her sexuality, and her needs isn't defined by her. When a woman publicly admits that she was sexually assaulted, she does so with the knowledge that she will be doubted, that people will try to tell her that she is mistaken. Like it or not, the status of being a victim taints you as if you had somehow asked for it, as if something about you implicitly drew the person closer. Shouldn't have been at that party. You were pretty tipsy. You guys were friends. That's like telling a woman that she doesn't know what she wants. That's like telling a woman that's what, that what's done with her body has nothing to do with her. That's like telling a woman that she can't tell the difference between pain and pleasure. For the people who need a different analogy than these examples, that's like telling the victim of a drunk driving car accident that he really shouldn't have been on the road that night. But we do it. This is what we hear. This is why we hear things like, some women are just unrapeable. This is why we talk about the friend zone, as if it's not enough to be just friends with a woman, that you're losing if you're in that in-between. Look at people like me. I am an individual who fully believes in her own empowerment and independence. Yet here I am, incredibly nervous to give this talk, 
feeling the full effect of the stigma surrounding women speaking out about sexuality. We have not made a place for that. People are intrinsically and inexplicably drawn to and confronted to with sex regardless of personal engagement. America reveres sex, yet simultaneously makes it a social taboo to talk about. We convolute the concept to the point where we're speaking about abstractions that no one understands. But we have the power to change that. Let's get rid of constricting dialogues and talk about facts. Let's embrace the uncomfortable. As Gloria Steinem once wisely said, if the shoe doesn't fit, must we change the foot? Particularly for scholars of women and gender studies, this conversation is not new. Research on the harmful and stereotypical presentations of women of color in the media, the hypersexualization and objectification of all women and unequal gender dynamics have been discussed over and over again. So what do we do? The first step is to talk about what we don't talk about. To overcome our own biases when it comes to talking about sex and to strip ourselves free from the notion of impurity. The second is to move this conversation from college level gender studies courses to an ongoing conversation among peers. From academic press university textbooks to green flyers in the locker room. From lecture halls to something we talk about with our children. If we truly want to present ourselves as an open-minded, contemporary, forward-thinking society full of empowered individuals, then we have to live up to those standards. We need to create the spaces where children can ask questions without the fear of being seen as deviant or naughty. We can implement the change that we want to see. We just have to do it. We have to continually diversify the representation of female sexuality in the media. This doesn't just benefit women. This benefits everyone around them. Just like any step towards equality, this is a step towards a greater, more understanding humanity. Thank you.